So firstly, um, welcome. Um, so I'm Ganesha Vakaria and I work at Endometriosis UK. Um, I am the Workplace Menstrual Wellbeing Manager and I am currently working on a project where I work with small and medium employers um, discussing six different uh, menstrual conditions um, and how your workplace can better your environment and the settings and make it a bit more comfortable um, for you to prosper and thrive in your workplace. So this is the second in the series and we're teaming up with Alison um, from Verity, who is a trustee there. Um, and she'll be talking about resources and how you can get support around PCOS. So she'll be um, speaking a bit later on. Um, we're also joined my, by Mr. Basil today as well. Um, and he is a specialist in reproductive medicine and surgery. Um, and it'd be really, you know, really important to have his kind of knowledge. Um, and he'll be sharing a lot around what PCOS is, the symptoms, the diagnosis and treatment, but what your workplace um, can do in order to make it a bit more comfortable for you to for you to work there with a condition like PCOS. Um, and lastly, we're joined by Kate Morris, who is an expert patient. And Kate today will be sharing her her story and her journey living with PCOS, um, especially with a focus on working and employment. So I'm actually going to pass over to Alison, who will introduce uh, Mr. Basil while we carry on. Thank you for the very humbling uh, present introduction and. Uh, before I start, I'd like to say thanks to Alison, Kate, and Ganesha for the great coordination of this. I'm going to be doing a lot of the talking, but actually they've done a lot of the hard work for putting this together. So I'm um, really grateful for you for coordinating this. And uh, um, I'm going to speak largely to an audience that I'm aware is mixed of employers, managers, and employees. And the objective is to raise awareness on what are the challenges of PCOS and the workplace. Um, the talk is a bit more generic and not very focused on particular areas of PCOS. I can literally talk about PCOS for two consecutive days and I wouldn't finish. And uh, so any questions are, will be greatly appreciated and I'll try my best to um, answer them. Um, I'm going to rely on Ganesha to swatch, uh, switch the slides. So thank you for tolerating me and being patient. Um, so firstly, it's largely underestimated how PCOS is common. It's actually the most common endocrine um, condition that affects women, period. So it's really, really common. And there is a varied estimation about its prevalence. And that is because it, it tends to have geographical sort of variations from one population to the other. Um, it tends to be more common in Asian and Black ethnicities than Caucasian ethnicities. And we estimate in the UK that it affects about one in 10 uh, or rather 10 to 15 percent of women. So as you can appreciate, it's a really common condition. And if you are an employer, you're very likely to, to have someone with PCOS in your workforce. But also the more likely is that you would not know about it. That is very likely that they would not feel empowered to share this knowledge. And also, as you can see in the numbers we're sharing in this slide, it's very, very likely that they would not have a robust diagnosis or robust management of PCOS, due, largely due to the la la large variations in management diagnosis and um, help that patients with PCOS can access in the NHS or, or generally. It is also a very, very common cause of inovulatory uh, subfertility, meaning the women with PCOS commonly do not have regular ovulation, regular periods, and as such, it's difficult for them to um, get pregnant spontaneously. Now, a common misconception is that PCOS causes infertility, meaning that they cannot get pregnant, which is inaccurate. Uh, it can be hopefully easily treatable once we induce ov ovulation and they can uh, hopefully uh, get pregnant um, uh, and then have start very healthy families. Um, um, can I have next slide, please? So what are sort of the symptoms or um, how does PCOS manifest? Unfortunately, it does manifest in, in quite different variation of symptoms from one um, person to the other. And that adds to the challenge of uh, A, reaching a diagnosis early on and B, offering reliable and sort of consistent management. Um, if in this slide, I'm sort of splitting it into predicted and unpredicted. And the reason I'm saying they're predicted is because 
if you are an employer and you know that some someone in your workforce has a PCOS, or if you're a, a colleague or employee and one of your friends or, or like co-workers have PCOS, these are the common things you you you'd expect that they would they would be suffering from, which is irregular periods. They often don't have any periods whatsoever. But more importantly, they can easily suffer from what we call in medical terms breakthrough bleeding, meaning very, you know, unpredicted, um, out of the blue bleed, which can be quite embarrassing. It could be quite um, sort of annoying at the workplace in a work environment, especially if you're someone who has a very active um, um, job or like very demanding job. So it's um, important to keep an open mindset and, and be aware that this could happen to them and, you know, perhaps offer some help. As I mentioned, they would commonly have irregular ovulation. Therefore, they will have fertility concerns and they would commonly need um, a sort of fertility treatment help. Not everyone, of course, with a PCOS will have this, but it is a very common um, presentation. One of sort of the landmark features of PCOS is um, an increase in the male hormone side that is being secreted from the ovaries, which manifests in excessive um, hair both on the face on the chest on the on the on the back or the arms and legs as well as um acne and and also that can um, be associated with thinning hair on the top in, in a medical term for that is alopecia and i'm sure you can Im Im imagine that these symptoms because they're visible they could be quite embarrassing for someone at the workplace and they could be quite troubled with them and a lot of my patients, unfortunately, cannot access reliable um, sort of laser treatment or hair removal services on the NHS, and not everyone can have access to these expensive treatments. So it's important to keep a sort of you know, a, a raise awareness about um, this varied presentation of PCOS. However, the unpredicted issue is that PCOS has varied presentation and progression uh, across the life cycle. And later on in life, it can increase the risk of developing type 2 diabetes. So someone who could start as healthy, they could move on to being pre-diabetic or sometimes type 2 diabetic at slightly earlier age than other cohorts. It can increase the risk of an ex excessive th um, thickness of the lining of the womb because they're not having regular periods and therefore an increase in the risk of cancer. They often have difficulty sleeping or what we'd call snoring. Um, so that could be a problem if someone has to sleep, for example, on site or work night shifts or something like that. And most importantly, as you could probably extrapolate from the fact that there is excessive hair and excessive weight issues, they commonly are problems with mental health issues such as anxiety, depression, and uh, body image and low self-esteem. And, and if if someone is put in an unsupporting environment, these mental health issues could be exacerbated quite easily. So hence why the objective of today's um, talk. Um, if we can move to the next slide, please. And so the diagnosis is largely based on clinical symptoms, and that is to have three out of two con out of two sort of conditions or symptoms. And the three are either a irregular or absent periods, excessive hair or acne uh, that is visible to a certain degree, and, uh, and plus minus having a, a appearance of polycystic, ov um, uh, polycystic ovaries or multiple cysts on the ovaries. Now, commonly these are called cysts. In reality, they are follicles. The distinction is that one is physiological and one is not, and it's just basically that due to the fact that these women are not having regular ovulation, uh, ovulation every cycle and not having very regular um, periods. That, in a way, puts a lot of difficulty in the medical field. It's sort of like the chicken and the egg, where what is causing PCOS is the ovary or the, or the hormones from the brain or, or the other way around. And unfortunately, until today, we just don't have an answer. Um, my personal way to go about it is that look I don't really need to know that question what I need to know is how I, how I can help my patients and what is the the treatment plan that they can that that, that uh, they would benefit from and you could probably sort of extrapolate as well from everything I'm, I'm saying about the symptoms is that the management is not simple it's not just one tablet that we give to someone with PCOS and say that's it you're fixed and see you in a year time 
it's far more complex. And as you can see from the half uh, from the uh, right side of the slide, there's so many different facets in this. And a large uh, sort of um, challenge is that there's very limited awareness from health professionals, um, that is including gynecologists like myself, a general physician, endocrinologist, just don't know about the multifaceted nature of PCOS or how to construct a individualized multifaceted treatment plan. Uh, so the current guidelines recommend that lifestyle interventions are uh, a first line of sort of treatment. And um, what I mean by lifestyle intervention is not just diet. Uh, it's also about optimizing your lifestyle. So exercising, uh, smoking cessation, um, avoiding stressors and so on. So it's just really spending time with someone with PCOS to understand their lifestyle and see how we can optimize it to offer them better control of their symptoms. Um a lot of um, the menstrual issues will be resolved with the pill. However, I don't want to oversell the pill as the panacea and it's the treatment for all. It is one uh, option of many. Uh, another option would be to put in an intra-atrine uh, coil. Uh, not very favorable to many, but it can work for um, uh, many patients brilliantly. Um, other medications that are commonly used include um, what we call antiandrogens, and these are tablets that reduce the male hormone side and therefore reduce the excessive hair and acne, so something like spare and lacton. And as I mentioned, there is higher risk of diabetes uh, later on in life, and that is because the insulin doesn't respond very well or behave well in, in PCOS. So metformin, an anti-diabetes uh, anti uh, drug, is commonly used to sort of attenuate the symptoms of PCOS. And lastly, we discussed sort of the cosme cosmetic treatment options, which is such as like placation, hair removal, um, laser treatment, and what have you. We move to the next slide, please. And a key message that I'd love to um, put forward is that PCOS is a lifelong condition. I wouldn't call it a disease, it's a condition. And someone with appropriate management and appropriate help, they can pretty much manage the symptoms of PCOS and have minimal symptoms of it. However, unfortunately, the biggest obstacle is that this sort of help is not always available, uh, specifically in the NHS context. And the other important thing, which you can probably decipher from this slide, and I'm sorry, it might be a bit busy, is that PCOS evolve with life stages and the treatment needs to be tailored to um, the women's sort of specific um, stage in life. So if I'm talking to a, an adolescent who is just about to have PCOS, they might, their primary concern probably will be the acne and the excessive hair. That is very different than when I'm speaking to someone who's 35 and just desiring a child and not getting it. So it's important to understand that PCOS will change and will evolve throughout women's life period. And therefore, the treatment and support and help needs to be tailored to that um, um, to that stage in life, and most importantly, to really what the patient wants. And so, if you are an employer in a similar situation, someone who is approaching menopause might have different um, uh, health challenges with PCOS than someone who are just starting their um, their uh, their career. Uh, can we move on, please? Next slide. So um, what I wanted to, unfortunately, there is not much, um, there is more and more now research about PCOS coming from the UK, but we have very limited sort of insights into our UK population. And we tend to use a lot of studies from, um, from other countries. So this is a, st a study that we recently did uh, with the help of Verity, where we surveyed uh, 300 plus women. And we asked them, how does PCOS affect you? And what are the challenges that you are facing in the NHS? And I wanted to share the findings of this and um, to offer sort of like more real life, very recent. So this was done last year. Insight into what are the, uh, what is the impact of PCOS? And as you can see in the strongly disagree uh, column, the majority felt that it was difficult for them to get a diagnosis. The majority felt that they could not access one stop clinic that could really address their symptoms. And unfortunately, the majority felt that their voices are not heard as patients in the NHS. So, you know, thanks to Verity's support, we're, we're, we're lobbying very hard to, to change that reality in the NHS. But if you look at the bottom of the screen, most of those that we surveyed 
actually had quite a significant impact on the quality of life because of PCOS. So while none of these symptoms sounds like life and death sort of symptoms, they, the, the combination of them often puts someone in the feeling that they are in a vicious loop where they just don't know how to address it. And it's like a you need to untangle it bit by bit and just help them understand their symptoms and just teach them how to get 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 more control to optimize their life. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? And so, as I was mentioning, if you we asked what are your health priorities, and as you can see, the top two health priorities was a we need better education for health professionals, and we can extrapolate that to better education of employers and uh, education for you know the um, people at the workplace, and also setting up specialist PCOS clinics. Now, trust me, this is extremely complex. I've been trying it in the NHS for many years. It, it, it's happening, but things on the NHS, unfortunately, moves very slowly. And uh, so um, these are the, the current um, sort of challenges. But as you can see, the list, the list goes on, but I'm just highlighting the um, the top, uh, top two or three. Uh, next slide, please. So what can we do and at the workplace what sort of interventions that you can you could use um i don't want to sign to sound to sound like i'm i'm lecturing but i think the key uh, most important element is be kind and just be appreciative of someone's symptoms and that they they probably find a great difficulty to open up and tell you that they have this condition and that they had it for very very many years and most importantly, they are frustrated because they they before they spoke with you, they've spoken with so many health professionals and none of them understood them. They go to see the GP and the GP send them to the gynecologist. The gynecologist treats one thing and then they go to send them to the endocrinologist and the dietitian and so on and so on and so on. And they feel they're just lost. So it's often not easy. And I, even myself as a specialist endocrine gynecologist, I have to probe about the different aspects before someone can really, before I can really get an understanding. So having this kindness and open-mindedness is, is important to help your colleague or your employee. Um, we all are familiar with, um, you know, the changing and the and the work uh, sort of location. And after COVID, maybe a positive of COVID, we're we're all more flexible and working from home, and that could be a major plus, specifically to someone who might be having very irregular periods. They might be they might be finding it very difficult to leave the house, or they might be feeling very ashamed that they might have to use the access the the the, the toiletries very frequently at the workplace. So offering this flexibility um, in the work pattern could be poten um, uh, potentially advantageous. Um, something I learned while we were preparing for for this um, um, uh, uh, webinar, and this shows how important for a clinician to work with a patient, because I, I learned that from Alison and Kate, is that a lot of um, women suffer from the fact that there is no uh, um, suitably tailored uniforms, and that could be quite... Um, perhaps the word fat shaming or something like that. And so um, it's important to keep that into perspective. Um, again, having easy access to uh, female friendly um, uh, laboratories, providing sanitary products at work um, is just basic decency, I'd, I'd say, to, to having a female workforce. And we all want to empower more uh, women at the workplace. And I think being mindful, aware of all these very very simple um, interventions can go a very long way um so this is a list of things that we would love to propose and equally would love your your thoughts on what else could be done and you know work to work jointly to um progress uh, from here but perhaps as a nice starting point um if we go to the next slide please so um, as I mentioned, there is more and more awareness and more research coming up about PCOS and perhaps a, a landmark piece um, evidence is the very recent update of the International Evidence-Based Guideline on PCOS. This is led by Monash University in Australia, but we, a few of us in the UK did participate and, and give um, sort of um, help in producing this guideline. It is a quite a nice, it is a heavy guideline to read, but it might give you that there, there are lay summaries for patients and the lay public of um, lay members of the public to read if you'd like to read a bit more beyond what I could explain in this very brief webinar. So I could, I, I thought it's nice to sign and post this, um, this document. 
But the key principle in this document is that it's trying to put the patient at the center of of the care and acknowledging that there are set, like a large number of stakeholders that need to be involved actively to um, uh, optimize um, the management of these ways. So that includes health professionals like myself, whether it's a GP, gynecologist, endocrinologist, bariatric surgeon, the list goes on. Whether it's an allied health professional like a dietitian or a community nurse, where, whether it's community health services like um, uh, family planning clinic uh, researchers that we are trying to work more and more uh, with um, lay patient representative because they do add great input and great value to our research and make it really impactful to 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 the patients and hopefully employers on board uh, thanks to you know effort like today and, and for an additional treat so this is kate morris and kate is our expert patient and we're very fortunate to have kate's experience and expertise and all things PCOS at this evening's webinar. Um, Kate was recently a trustee at Verity, uh, so has lots of experience advocating and being ambassador for PCOS. And Kate has run very successful PCOS support groups, providing safe, supportive and welcoming friendship groups. So over to Kate for her story. Hi. So I haven't got any slides. I just I just want to keep it chatty, really. Um, thank you to Mr. Vettler, who's covered a lot of a lot of ground there. But I want to kind of present um, to you what my life as a professional with PCOS has looked like over the years. Um, I'm a teacher. In hindsight, I realised that working in what is a very pastoral focused listening environment has been a huge advantage to me I didn't I didn't really realize that um until recently but um if I just pick up um I made some notes while Mr Vassar was talking and I was thinking right okay what can I pick up on here excess weight fat people look at me um I thought it was just me when I was at university and I was putting on weight at the rate of two stone per year, I thought I was eating and drinking the same as all my friends, but for some reason I was piling it on. And it wasn't until I went to a Verity conference and I walked into a room of women who looked like me and the penny dropped. This isn't me. This is something to do with this condition. And we hear that I've got a slow metabolism, you know, it's in my genes. Guys, with PCOS, being morbidly obese is part of this condition. And unfortunately, for a lot of us, by the time we realise it's linked, we're already there. Um, and as a professional woman, that is far more of a handicap than I than I would like to admit. So Vassal mentioned uniform, and it was me that brought it up the other day because I'm supporting a colleague at the moment who, um, she works in a warehouse. Um, she's a size 28, she's strong as an ox, um, does her job really, really well. Um, but she's not allowed a water bottle on the shop floor. She has to wait for breaks. Um, and her uniform is made of 100% polyester. And she's exhausted. She's sweating profusely to the point that she's in the bathroom crying um and i think she may well be a victim of let's call it fat shaming whatever you want to call it but believe me if there was anything she could do about it she would do it um i lost a job at pizza land many moons ago because the skirt didn't come in a 26 no, no green skirts in size 26. Um, off you go. Um, and I think with, with PCOS, the, 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 the fact that this overweightness is something that that is debilitatingly unmanageable. I have to be on a diet to stay the same. So I'm morbidly obese. I haven't put on any weight for the last 10 years. My endocrinologist is beside himself with joy. Um, because that is an achievement. Um, my colleagues have been awesome. 
but only because I was willing to tell them. So there's a little bit of that in my story. I am the sort of person who will go to work and put my PCOS in your face if I think I need your support. But what I said to my colleagues was, if I was an alcoholic and you knew that, you wouldn't leave half empty bottles of vodka and whatever lying around the office because you would know that I would struggle with that. So what I need you to do, guys, is is a, is adopt the same principle with um, trigger foods for me. Um, for most women with PCOS, they are your kind of fast carbohydrates, your cakes and your biscuits and the kind of thing that routinely is left lying around in offices. So my colleagues were absolutely brilliant um, in that regard. Um, I do suffer from um, the PCOS hairy chin. I care a lot less about it now than when I did than I did when I was 20. Um, and I think in employment terms, the biggest handicap to my career was that from the age of 20 to about probably 35, everything I said went through the hand. And that wasn't because the hair was there. It was because I wondered if it might be. Um, so I was always really, really, and you know, people would say, you know, speak up, can't hear you, <laughs> talking through my hand. Um, and that that is tough. That is really, really tough, especially working in a school. I was never, ever bullied out loud by a colleague, but oh man, I've had some comments from um, kids. Kids are, woo. Um, but my colleagues were very supportive because I said, look, you know, this this isn't on. You know, I, I don't appreciate kids in assembly walking past me and telling mom, telling me my moustache is looking good. Um, it's just not acceptable. Um, fertility, the big one. I, as Alison said, I, I run a number of support groups um, for women. And there are various stages in the fertility treatment journey. And I'll, I'll just make it simple. Um, it's usually more complex. But once a couple discover that they need support, they've usually been trying unsuccessfully for at least 12 months, usually. Um, I would hope not in the case of PCOS because they should be able to say to their primary care practitioner, look, you know, we've got PCOS, this is going to be a struggle, don't send us away to try for another year. Um, but they, they've been trying one way or another and that in itself is really, really hard. Um, so they have a breakthrough, they get referred for fertility treatment. Now, the first line of treatment is often, uh, Mr. Vetter will tell me if it's changed its name, but when I was on it, it was called Clomid or Clomiphene. Now, what that does is uh, send you absolutely loopy bonkers, basically. Yeah, we all know that that the menstrual cycle is associated with mood swings. So anything that you do to a woman that is messing with that cycle is going to have mood swing effects. Now, what the clomiphene is actually doing is it's supporting the ovary to ovulate, essentially. Um, but I found it really, really, really debilitating. Um, and it would have been so helpful at that point because I hadn't shared my infertility with anybody at school um, and it would have been so helpful at that point if I'd had a trusted friend or a, a, a women's health advocate that I could have phoned up and said look I'm taking this drug it's got me sitting on the kitchen floor rocking I don't know what's going on it's like PMT off the scale a hundred times over I think I'll be fine tomorrow and not have to justify that, but it was it was the notion of having to justify it that I think um, was was the most difficult. So um, that went on probably for about eighteen months, repeat cycles, and um, eventually we were referred for IVF treatment. And I thought, oh, I can't. There's no way I can't do this. I can't teach full time and do IVF. This is bonkers. Um, so I went to see my head teacher, and I said, look, I'm. I need to resign to what you're talking about resign you're not resigning what you're doing I said look you know we're about to start IVF treatment it's it's going to be a rough road um I, I just don't think I can juggle it I can't I can't be what you need me to be and focus on this journey um 
And I don't know if it's because she was a woman. I mean, I, I have no idea. She was just an amazing human being. And she said, well, you're not resigning. You're not resigning. She said, how, how, you know, talk me through the next 12 months. And I said, well, um, basically in a month's time, I'll start injecting myself and I'll probably be, you know, emotionally an absolute wreck. And then a couple of weeks after that, um, they'll put the embryo in a Petri dish and then they'll grow it a bit and then they'll put it back in. And then about eight weeks after that, um, I'll know if we're pregnant or not. And she's like, right, OK, that's not 12 months. I said, yeah, I know, but you have to kind of rest your body in between. So before you can try again, you need another six months. And she's like, well, you come to work in those six months then. That's what you do. You come to work in those six months. And then when you start the next cycle, we do it again. And I said, yeah, but I'm not sick. I'm not sick. I'm, I'm not poorly. She said, well, you're, you're undergoing medical treatment. As far as I'm concerned, you're off sick. You know, three months off sick, six months back at work, three months off sick. We'll do it as long as it takes. I said, well, basically, we'll do it till the money runs out, runs out. And for us, that was two cycles. That was two cycles, but it was two years. Um, but she allowed me to go off sick for three months. Unsuccessful cycle, come back to work for, I think, about eight months. I think knowing that at any point I was going to turn up in her office again and say, well, who we've got our next slot. Um, we're starting again um, and she was amazing um, so supportive so I kept my job which meant when it was all over I had my job to go back to now once the IVF was over me and my partner decided to adopt and I thought oh here we go again because the um, adoption leave rules are the same for adoption as they are for maternity leave so I thought, oh, crikey. So again, I go to the boss and I say, look, I feel really bad. Um, you were so supportive during the IVF and it didn't work. And, and you've you've invested all that time in me. And now I'm asking to go off on adoption leave. Um, again, she was absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. Um, took my adoption leave. Now, sadly, for various reasons, our adoption didn't um didn't work out now when that happens i don't know if you're aware of this if a woman gives birth and their baby dies or they adopt a child and the adoption fails they're still entitled to the rest of their maternity leave i suppose as kind of grieving leave if you like um but i didn't want that i wanted to go back into work but because i'd had that conversation with her i was able to ring her and say look and she's like no you're entitled to stay off i was like no i know i'm entitled to stay off but i need to be in I need to come in. I need to be back. Um, and again, she was absolutely amazing. Um, other stuff. So that was a big thing. That was about five years of my life during which I, I couldn't have been more grateful for the flexibility that my head teacher at the time showed me. Um, just checking the timer. Yeah, we're doing OK. So fatigue, tiredness, um, sleep apnea. Sleep apnea, snoring, yeah, but it keeps you awake, keeps you awake and it's exhausting, absolutely exhausting. A lot of women, they they ask in our support groups, does PCOS cause fatigue? And they want us to say, yes, it's chemical, it's chemical, it's in your blood, it causes fatigue. Well, no, it doesn't. It just makes you tired. There are all the associated risks of being overweight very often. Not everybody's overweight, by the way, um, but those of us that are um tend to be quite excessively so um but it causes things that make you tired um you know you, you put, you're put, you're you're constantly on a diet you're not eating a, a, a healthy balanced diet a lot of the time because you're you're paranoid about your weight so you're probably not eating enough to sustain the amount of effort that you're putting into to life and and being uh being alive um and um one of the routine treatments, if you like, management drugs is a drug called metformin. Now, metformin is a tricksy one because it's very, very difficult to tolerate. Um, how can I describe it? I'm a teacher and I took my metformin three days out of five. I'd be absolutely fine. On day four, randomly in the middle of a lesson, I would have to run out of my classroom to go to the toilet um, due to the gastrointestinal impact. And I've met so many women, so many women who are non-compliant with that treatment 
because of that side effect it does it does get better but it can take a few months and you have to build your dose up um so each time you put your dose up you're back to square one with the side effects um i usually used to try and do it in the summer holidays so at least by the time we went back in september i was six weeks in so the toilet dashes were getting more um less frequent but so many women that i know have been non-compliant on that treatment because they can't manage it at work so the bathroom thing for women with pcos is is it's it's a it's it's a it's a double hug if you like because there's the unexpected period that suddenly floods and then there's what we in the community call metformin belly um which a lot of us suffer with as well um, I've had various line managers over the years. One, one guy, <laughs> I absolutely adored him. He was half my age, um, chronically embarrassed talking about anything like this, but really, really wanted to be supportive. So I never subjected him to any in-depth conversations. Um, but something he used to do that was lovely um, you know, those emails, you know, so and so's had a baby. Woohoo, let's all be joyous. And he would, within about an hour of the email, he would come and find me and he would just say, I saw the email about Noddy. Are you okay? Yeah. Now, for his sake, I usually said, Yeah, mate, I'm fine. But actually, him bothering to ask if I was okay after. IVF treatment that's unsuccessful is is essentially multiple bereavements. Um, you're not like any other woman who's had a miscarriage because, as I've already said, my second IVF was uh, resulted in a pregnancy and a miscarriage. Um, and somebody at work did say to me, "Well, you're just like any other woman that's had a miscarriage." And I was like, "No, no, I'm not, because I can't go again. We're we're out of money. That's it. It's over." we're done um so yeah a, mi a miscarriage in a woman with pcos who's been having fertility treatment is a that's a that's a life-changing event that's a proper getting your head round potentially being childless for the rest of your life so um it's a huge event for any woman but for a woman who's been having fertility treatment it's it's crushing um depression and anxiety yes i suffered with both i also then had to grieve my inability to have children and that's the point at which it all culminated um and i know a lot of women whose employers have um counseling programs that they are referred to um but i also know that they're very often limited um so an employer will say yes you can get counseling we can provide you with counseling you get three sessions now i was really lucky we had counsellors in school volunteer counsellors who work with the kids um and the the guy that did it was was willing to work with staff as well um so we weren't paying going rate anything near but it took me three and a half years of near weekly appointments to unpick all my self-esteem issues my self-doubt issues my my grief issues it took a really really long time um, so providing counselling can be a bit of a, a red herring, um, you know, and if and if you provide counselling, are, are you providing a doorway into counselling that the employee is then going to have to self-fund moving forwards because you're not going to fix anything in three sessions? Um, or are you genuinely investing in that employee um, and supporting them until they're better? Um, and I was really lucky. My employer wanted to invest in me. They wanted me back on my game um, and they invested in that support until I was better. A um, bit like Mr. Vatter, really, I could talk all day. But one of the things he said that I, I'm not sure whether that sort of translated into daily um, what it feels like Um is the, the, the number of different medical appointments. So um, I would say, well, I don't know, I probably averaged at least one every half term over one every half term. No, maybe one a term, one a term. So that's quite a lot, isn't it? Annually, three hospital visits. 
Um, but one would be for the PCOS clinic, the polycystic ovary clinic. Then there'd be one for the endocrinologist to follow up on something that the clinic had picked up. Then there'd be the referral to the dietitian. Then there'd be the referral to the fertility people. Then there'd be the blood test to see if I was type two diabetic. Um, and I remember somebody at work once, she's a lovely woman, she's the head's PA. She said to me, every time you, because we used to have to hand in a hospital letter to say why we were um, absent. And she said to me, she said, you must be really poorly because every time you hand in a hospital letter, it's for a different department. Ha ha. And I said, yes, mate. <laughs> yeah, but the, it's it's all the same. It's the same condition, different departments all over the place. Um, a lot of blood tests have to be done on certain days in the menstrual cycle um, or even at certain times of day, fasting, etc., etc. So I can understand it's frustrating for a woman asking for time off work to go for a blood test. But if it's got to be done on day five of the menstrual cycle in a pre-fasting state, she may well not know about that until Monday when she's got to have the blood test on Wednesday. Um, and, um, you know, that can, medical appointments can be unpredictable, unplannable, multiple and take a long time. A fasting glucose test takes half a day um, and that's once you get in. So a lot of um, hospital appointments, et cetera, et cetera. I'm just going to look at my own list. Covered everything and my time has gone off. One, one last thing. My school, my employer, really big on um, exercise for staff. You could play football. You could play netball, you could go running, you could do everything. Yeah, what I wanted was chair yoga. That's what I wanted. Something realistic that I could engage with. Um, and, and Mr. Vassar mentioned lifestyle change. Um, lifestyle change is just as important for morbidly obese women with PCOS as it is for anybody else. It's just we we can't run and we can't and we can't and we can't. So if 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 you are an employer who offers those programs um do do be mindful that you know there may well be people there with dodgy knees you know a bit of chair yoga that'd be, that'd be great for them as well um i've used up my time it was inevitable um happy to answer any questions um throw them in the chat okay thanks for your time thanks kate i'm gonna hand back to alison while i get ready to share my screen again Oh my goodness, what a what an amazing story and patient experience you just listened to from Kate. And we're very grateful for Kate for being so candid, so open, so honest about very, very personal things. And I think that just shows you very clearly a kind of a perfect PCOS case study and all the kind of the different challenges that have been experienced over many, many years. So Thank you, Kate, from all of us for being a very, very passionate and perfect expert patient. Thank you very much indeed. No, thank uh, you. That, that's a fantastic compliment coming from you, Alison, because you've had it many times before. Thank you. That's absolutely. So a little bit about kind of verity. So obviously we're doing uh, Endometriosis UK are doing a series of webinars about women's health and women's health strategy and also important to engage employers, et cetera, to kind of for them to become more aware of women's health issues and to support their employees out there because there's a lot of women out there in the workplace doing various jobs, various shifts, various hours, et cetera, et cetera. And so there is a, a national charity called, um, so you know, Endometriosis UK is the national charity for endometriosis and uh, which is really good that we, there's that charity. And there's also Verity, a charity for those with PCOS as well. And it's called Verity um, because, and not because someone put a name in a hat or whatever, but back in 1997, when it was established, it's, it was deemed to be kind of the truth, you know, the French for truth, and about sharing the truth about PCOS, you know, with as many people as possible. And that kind of philosophy has remained with us since 1997. And so at the moment, it is the UK charity for women with PCOS. Um, it's run by volunteers. And our focus is to raise the profile of PCOS and improve the lives of individuals 
who have PCOS by education, research, information, and events such as this. So it's uh, I always get very excited uh, and energized by these these events that we uh, kind of host. Uh, and it's good that we do a lot more co-hosting and collaborative work with our Endometriosis UK colleagues. So we are a UK charity, but all the four trustees are volunteers. So we all complete this work in our evenings, weekends and annual leave. And I've been a trustee for about 18 years. September is actually our awareness month. So please do visit our website and social media platforms to follow and support our activities this month. Um, and also the slide has tons of contact information at the top for resources and support about our website, Endometriosis UK's website, also about um, the kind of the gen generic email address that you can email us on, which is the admin one, which is the second one down. So please do kind of access all our resources to help support you and your colleagues out in your workplaces. And also, please do support PCOS Awareness Month. It's a really important month. It's a good focus for us to raise the profile and to kind of remind people what it's like to have PCOS and how they can support. And thank you for all of your support tonight. And in some senses, if you could do a favor to us, you, you've been here, share the webinar, share it with friends, share it with work colleagues. You know, share it with other kind of organizations you worked with this. So at the moment, just pass the message on. That's all that we can ask and for, your, for you to support us. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Alison. Thank you for that. Um, so this is going to be um, probably one of the final slides before we do the Q&A. Um, so these are kind of six tips to take away. Um, and given what Mr. Waters, Kate and Alison has already mentioned, um, it's just a quick snippet of what we've already discussed in the webinar. Um, so number one is raise awareness of PCOS in the workplace. So, you know, any managers or your HR department or any other colleagues in the workplace have conversations about PCOS and be able to cascade that awareness um, down into your employees as well. So the more people that know about the condition, the more comfortable it makes the individual feel within the workplace. Um, and they feel a bit more understood as well. Um, the second thing is, you know, look at your policies. Do they need updating? Um, do they need amending? Um, do your current, uh, current policies ensure those with PCOS are not disadvantaged? So it's really great to have a look at the, the key policies that affect. This could be like, um, you know, sick policies or, you know, your contracted hours, et cetera, which we'll talk about in another couple of points. Um, be supportive. Um, encourage staff members who do suffer from the condition to feel like they have a safe space. Um, you know, some staff will be really shy or may not have the confidence to even speak up about the condition that they have. Um, so again, create an environment where they feel they can talk about it, going back to the first point around raising awareness, um, the chances are they will be more more communicative, more they will talk more, um, and you know everyone can really understand what they're suffering from, and then people can really help them and be supportive. Um, ask individuals what they need. It's great to you know have conversations, and it's great that you know you are all here and learning, um, but it's not benefiting anyone, especially individuals with PCOS, just to assume that if we do X, Y, and Z, um, that it will help them. Having those conversa conversations with the individual and asking them what they need and how, you know, you can help them uh, make their work environment and the work life a bit better for them um, is where you should start. Um, and they'll be really open into, you know, telling you a bit more about the condition, how it impacts them, and what little changes can happen um, for them to, you know, thrive in the workplace and how things can be improved. Um, point number five, be practical, um, ensure any necessary arrangements and changes um, happen with ease, especially with anyone with PCO symptoms um, while exploring at work. Um, for example, little things like where are they based in terms of their desk? Is it really far away from the, you know, the bathrooms? Can we move it around, make them feel a little more comfortable and try and be as practical as, as possible in different kind of arrangements and changes. Um, and lastly, be flexible. Um, if staff isn't performing or if there's, there is a sudden drop in attendance, going back to what Kate said about, you know, medical appointments, etc. Um, if they are coming up, just have a conversation with the with the individual and with your employee, because they will probably have um, an underlying health issue. And obviously, it, 
may or may not include PCOS, but having those conversations and being flexible, um, you know, could there be work from home policies? So if they do have a, a doctor's appointment, could you work around it? Could they still do their job, um, but be a bit more comfortable for them where they go to a doctor's appointment and they get to just work from home? Um, so these are the kind of things I, I would love for you guys to take away um, and really maybe start thinking about integrating in your workplaces to better environment needs for um, people with PCOS. I have actually now come to the end of the webinar. Um, I just firstly want to thank um, Mr. Waters, Alison and Kate for coming on. Um, Kate for sharing your story and Alison, Mr. Waters, just sharing the knowledge and, and the support and where we can or where the attendees can look. Um, so that's been great in terms of support. So yeah, thank you very much for attending. And I just want to thank the attendees for coming today as well. Absolutely. Um, yeah, it's been Absolutely. really great, great turnout. And I'm hoping, you know, you've taken something from today and it will kind of benefit the workplace or at least you can impact it. Um, and it'd be great to hear also what you've learned from today and how you will cascade that into your into your into your workplace as well. Um, I guess that's the end of the webinar. So um, links will be shared. This was recorded. You will find it on um, Endometriosis UK's YouTube channel once we've edited edited it, etc. Um, and I'm sure Verity will also be putting it up on their platforms as well. So thank you all for coming, um, and I hope you have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and good night, everyone. Good Take night. care. Bye.